These days, any racing game which doesn't come with a triple digit roster of licensed cars feels a bit stingy. Even detailed simulations of specific motorsport often feel the need to bolster their offerings with historic vehicles and support series to make up the numbers. And it would be a rare simulator that didn't allow you to drive whichever vehicle on the grid you desired, each with its own unique graphical and physics models. But this attitude stems from the late 90s, and in particular the huge influence of Gran Turismo. A game which not only set the idea that each console needed a flagship racing game, but also that said game should take the form of a smorgasbord simulator. A buffet of small dishes. All of the choice, but none of the depth. You can race a Japanese or European touring car in Gran Turismo 2, but you won't be able to assemble an entire field or visit the real-life tracks. You can go rallying, but if you're expecting all the stages of the World Rally Championship to be present, you'll be disappointed. Later editions of the series and its competitors applied this philosophy to more motorsports, featuring prototypes, NASCAR, and all sorts of single-seater series with the inevitable one or two cars and one or two tracks from each. But even this tapas approach still means a big list of cars and a big list of tracks, especially when you also include the obligatory road and sports cars which have been a mainstay of driving games since the days of test drive. Dedicated sims always felt a little light on things to do by comparison. For its first couple of iterations, Gran Turismo was an outlier though. Although car numbers in competitors started to creep up with titles such as the Dreamcast's Metropolis Street Racer, it wasn't until the PS2 and Xbox era where any franchise worth its salt had to break the magic three digits for its roster. And it's hard to explain to anyone who wasn't there what a ridiculous fantasy number even the original GT's 200 or so cars sounded like, let alone the sequel 650. Test Drive had five cars, its sequel only two, unless you bought the expansion discs or a later port with the Diablo included. Car and Driver was generous at 10. The first Need for Speed offered 8, plus a hidden fantasy bonus car. But for Mini, it was just one. This became oddly common toward the end of the 90s, with games that made a feature out of offering only a single vehicle. Porsche Challenge with its Boxster, Beetle Adventure Racing for the N64, Sega's punishingly realistic F355 Challenge, and on the PC, the game in the title, MGI's Viper Racing. This may seem weird, in a decade where Polyphony Digital offered you multiple types of 1991 Mazda MX-5, let alone any other cars, but there was a certain, perhaps well-founded, snobbery to watch the early smokersport simulators. Surely with this many cars, nobody would be able to spend enough time to make sure the data was correct and that they handled like the real thing. Was it even possible to build a physics model that handled everything, from a small hatchback to a rally raid special? Gran Turismo didn't help the case with its infamous susceptibility to data and translation bugs, like a 5 to 8 i with only 142 brake horsepower. And this was in fact the output of the engine in kilowatts. Single vehicle games prided themselves on the ability to focus on a single vehicle and get it exactly right. F355 Challenge reportedly used measurements from Yu Suzuki's actual Ferrari 355 during actual track driving. What could be more faithful than that? Weirdly, this boast was carried even by the arcade titles like Porsche Challenge, supposedly a recreation of the Boxster, faithful to every data point and driving situation Porsche could dig up. Man, being on the research team for Beetle Adventure Racing must have been an event. Viper Racing came along at the intersection of both this and the fascination with PC driving ultra-realism in the wake of Papyrus's Grand Prix Legends. And much like that game, it reviewed well, except for the occasional reviewer getting frustrated by the complexity of the physics, and then pretty much sank without trace. MGI moving on to create the far more well-known NASCAR Heat series. 
strangely, without as much of the detailed physical simulation involved in Viper racing. But anyway, I've run through enough intro for now, and it's time to do some Viping. Or I would like it to be. First off, Viper Racing is one of those games which really does not want to run on Windows 10. If you have the release version, it will quit with a terse message that the game does not run on Windows NT. If you have a patched version, and are unlucky enough to have a graphics card with an exact multiple of 4GB of memory, it will quit with an angry log file, questioning how it is expected to run on a card with 0 megabytes of memory. If you go for all of that, and get a hand-patched version of the race.bin file which ignores this check, it will run, but everything black will be transparent. Here is where you'll find an incredibly frustrating feature of Viper Racing. The normal thing to do in this situation is insert DG Voodoo 2, which will provide its own emulation of a vintage graphics card. But Viper Racing is absolutely determined to load the default Windows ddraw.dll, no matter how many tips and tricks from Vogons I attempt to follow. At the end, I simply attacked it in the most crude way possible and Look, I'm not proud, but I do have a working game here. But having finally gone through the pain of getting to that point, does it hold up? Graphically, the answer is sadly not. By tweaking the DG Voodoo settings, I've been able to fix the game's watery MIP mapping and get the resolution nice and crisp. But all those pixels show up the lack of detail in the environments and the unimaginative textures. Admittedly, I recall this looking a lot better in 640x480 at a time when software rendered 320x200 was still a recent memory, but the aesthetic is very stark and dull, even if it does run fluidly. Even the tracks are so obviously fictional, a few more trackside objects and the occasional tunnel full of vintage 90s coloured lighting wouldn't have gone amiss. Need for Speed 3 looked a lot better, despite similar hardware requirements. But how does Viper Racing play? I think this might have been one of those games where how much you loved it depended on how many other games you had to distract you. Because it's very easy to bounce off, especially if you don't realise you need to spend some time with this somewhat inscrutable menu to get controls approximating some level of playability. But to complain about this is effectively me moaning that a game from late 1998 is uh, from late 1998. At least it has the ability to tune your controls. Providing you play with the menus and increase steering lock in the garage, it doesn't feel too bad on a 900 degree wheel either. There are some disappointments. I couldn't get it to recognise half the gears on my shifter. The force feedback is more force than feedback. If you've ever done a three-point turn in a car without power steering, you'll know what you're in for. With the wheel set up, it does have a reasonably entertaining handling model, though I'm not sure the promise of ultimate realism from simulating just one model of car was truly realised. The visceral heft and brutal nature of the Viper never quite come through, except maybe when you're trying to deal with the game's rather obstinate simulation of a manual gearbox and clutch. The AI are capable of putting up a decent challenge without too much obvious rubber banding, at least for me. And while they mostly play fair, they do like the occasional multiple pile-up on a tricky corner. There's also a career mode, a little bit of Gran Turismo-style customization, where you can buy upgrade parts to make your Viper even faster, although there's no trading it in for another car once you get bored of it. Although we do have a paint shop. I should not be allowed in the paint shop. Later patches added the option to drive a couple of other cars from this hack menu, even though your opponents stay firmly in their titular Vipers for their racing. And this spawned a small modding scene, the output of which has now, of course, inevitably disappeared. Think someone made a Citroen BX at one point? And yes, the entry marked plane 
does what you'd expect. I'm not sure exactly what you expect from the phrase hornball, but having found it, this is exactly what you need with the M25 is four abreast with people all doing 52 miles per hour and failing to overtake each other. But much as I can mention these unique points and be nice about the things Viper Racing does well, this was destined to be an also ran game. I enjoyed my copy for its physics, but there wasn't much to do in game once you had raced one Viper against some other Vipers on each of the game's tracks and watched how the suspension bobbled as you went over bumps. Speaking of those tracks, the game never seemed to know exactly what it wanted to be. Driving dynamics were realistic, but the tracks belonged in an arcade game. Even there, they didn't fully commit to the arcade ethos, leaving out the near misses with trackside objects, wild architecture and bright colours of a true arcade track design. In addition to being stayed, there were a few too many textures that looked like they took all of 20 seconds to make in PaintShop Pro, worsening the appearance of already stark track environments. Which is a shame, as I'd love to have found a hidden gem from my youth that was worth the amount of pain and frustration it took to get it running correctly on a modern operating system. But while, if you find it cheap, it might still be worth checking out, for most of us that promise of dedicated subject realism goes unfulfilled and you're likely to have more fun just buying a late 90s Viper in your favourite Smirkersbird simulator.